What's this all about, Simo? That's an English center, or ESL as most people call it, right? English Learning Center, yep. where you go to find a foreign teacher, someone like us, Usually. to go learn English. You pay tuition, you go to classes, you, uh, you, know, you can go from kindergarten level all the way up to high school, basically. And it's gotcha. always after normal school. Right? Okay. You don't just study there predominantly. Should we go this way? Okay. So why are we talking about English? Well, that's because most people that come to Asia or are a gap here, earn a little money, what do they do? They teach English. Okay. In fact, especially in a place like China, you're very limited when it comes to job options. Right. You know, the population is so huge that they can't afford to give normal everyday jobs away to foreigners. Right. So you could never go to China and be, I don't know, a street sweeper or, I don't know, anything normal, a postman or something, right? You just right. can't do it. But you, you could do something which the locals can't do, and that is speak English right. and be white right. or be brown, right. which they're not. Right. So if you have a different... <laughs> oh, sorry, what's... Hello. What is, what is that? I have no idea. <laughs> anyway. It's like fe fetal photography. Fetal photography. Okay, go um, ahead. Sorry. Mm, because you're different, right. you can get a job teaching uh, your native language. Unfortunately, most languages other than English are not in demand. Right because everybody sees English as a, a ticket out of mundanity, really. Right. It allows the very um, lower caste people, if they can speak English, they can then get jobs in the hospitality industry. Right. You know, work at a hotel, work at a restaurant, work at a place where foreigners hang out, because in a lot of the, the countries such as Vietnam uh, and these developing countries, it's the foreigners coming in that bring in the money. Right. So if you want to be near the money, you learn English. Right. Even better, it might give you an opportunity to travel overseas to a European country or America or Australia or something like that. So right. it's basically there to open a door for you. So English is still in very high demand right. in most developing countries. Right. You name it, India, Vietnam, Laos, Cambodia, any, any of these uh, developing uh, countries, China too, still very high in demand. Right. So um, we thought we'd make this video to demystify yourself. Yes and give you guys some options if you're thinking about doing it and we're also going to tell you why maybe you should consider not doing it as well right so give you a balanced perspective uh, i think we should quickly start out with a very brief now very very brief history of our own esl experience yes uh, 30 seconds or less, go. I was in America. I knew that I had to get a TEFL certificate on top of my bachelor's degree. Yep. Did an online course and literally didn't learn anything. Right. So when I went to China, I'm not even joking, and this, this is going to make us, or at least me, sound very unprofessional. Right. But I thought you'd just go into a classroom and just start speaking English. Oh, okay. Thankfully, they quickly trained me. Best hmm. training I got was actually in Taiwan at Hess. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, lesson plans every day, go into a classroom of about eight to 20 kids. Yeah. Go through the lesson plan, play a game, teach grammar, teach vocabulary, drill it the next day. Sure. It's a repeat, right? Gotcha. First job is in Huizhou. Yeah. Uh, made about 800 bucks a month. Right. Uh, what about you? Uh, okay. Well, I didn't teach English when I first got to China because I didn't know what I was going to do. I had no jobs, no contacts. Anyway, I've told the story a million times. I ended up homeless. Right. A guy I knew hooked me up with an agent. Right. I got to sleep on the agent's couch. Right. And he got me like this dodgy under the table full time. Uh, not, well, not full time. I was spending the whole day going from kindergarten to kindergarten out in the middle of nowhere. Right. Uh, and that's how I got off my feet was doing kindergarten teaching. Right. But during this whole time, you know, I was learning the language. I was making connections. <clears throat> and I actually ended up uh, moving a little bit up from normal basic English teaching, I started to do more uh, cultural stuff. You know, I would go in to tell people about how to deal with foreigners if you're going to do play the stock market or, right. you know, they, I used to go uh, train some managers in Tencent, you know, about if they were to travel overseas, what to expect. Right. ESL, why is it a good idea? Why is it a bad idea? The first thing I would say is that, like you just mentioned, ESL gives you an opportunity if you are a go-getter to get inside the country. Yes. And then find other work, right? It's very difficult to find other work. So yeah. unless you're the kind of person that's really willing to go out of their way. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> to try and make those connections, like you said. Mm -hmm. um, 
maybe not the best career option because yeah. the average ESL teacher doesn't improve their life in terms of salary or living quality. Yes. They get free accommodations usually in a crappy apartment. Mm -hmm. And when you're done, you're just kind of done. You, yeah. Maybe you saved a little money, but there is no career leverage that yeah. the average teacher is going to get. So that's something to keep in mind. I think it's a very short-term thing, and it's not a bad idea, mm. but it's a very short-term thing. Yeah, I think we should uh, try to separate it into two types of people. Now, the, right. whoever you are out there, you're either the kind of person who's young, energetic, wants to go out there and pay their way through uh, an amazing experience, right. like a big party, right. right? Go to China, go to Vietnam, go to Japan, go to Thailand, any one of these places, right? right? Have a fantastic life, going out drinking, making friends, exploring, traveling, but you need to pay for it, right? Right. That's where like a gap year ESL type gig would be great. Yeah, it'd be fun. Yeah, you get to experience a new culture, new food. Right. You know, new dating options. Right. Whatever. And uh, I'd say go for it. That's a, that's a fantastic way to go and explore and, and earn some real money to keep yourself going. Right. So if you're yeah. that type of person, yeah. I think it's a great idea. Yes, absolutely. And then it doesn't really matter which country you go to. No. There are drawbacks, which we'll talk about a little later, right. of each country. But then you get the second kind of person, someone like you and me, who we're not out for a big party, but we're actually out there to try and make a life. Right, right. To make a different life. Me, I was basically escaping a crappy country that has no future. Right. Because of the color of my skin. Right. So. Asia was an exciting and interesting place to go with lots of opportunity to really, well, I thought, make a life. Right. Get married, start a family, you know, really build up, build myself up from scratch, really. Right. What were your motivations? Uh, escaping boredom, to be honest. Okay. And it was my fault. Looking back at it, yeah. I know that I could have improved my own life situation without doing this. Sure. Uh, but, you know, when you live in small town America, you start to think in the lens of it. That's all life is. Right. So you see the hustle and bustle and the chaos of these Asian countries. And you're like, this looks pretty freaking cool, right? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So that was my motivation. But um, I think we should get into Continue two things. straight. Yep. Number one, we address the kind of person that should do it. Yes, you got the first, two types of situations. First, let's talk, first let's talk about um, the actual people that shouldn't do it. Right. And then go to the four countries and talk about the drawbacks and, and bonuses with them. Okay, good. So the kind of person that uh, shouldn't do ESL <laughs> is somebody who is very closed-minded mm -hmm. and also someone who's uh, afraid of this, like dirt, basically. Right. <laughs> is there, is okay. there a better way to say that? No, no, I mean, okay. that's a good point. All right. I would say another kind of person that shouldn't do it. Yeah. Someone who is passionate about education. Right. And I say right. that, and it sounds weird. Yeah. But you will be told what to do yeah. within that framework. Oh, yes. And whatever like methodology you can bring from back home, you might be able to spice up the lesson plans with it. But in the, at the end of the day, there's a lot of different reasons people send their kids to English school. And it's probably not your kind of Western lens about like creativity building, all this kind of stuff, right? Mm -hmm. So a lot of people get really disappointed when they care so much about their yeah. job and their actual uh, material and stuff. Yes. So that's, that's another Dude, thing. Dude, yeah, you hit the nail on the head. So many of my friends who I've met throughout the years, I should say acquaintances, other than you and maybe one or two other people, I don't have that many foreign friends that right. I've met. But many of the acquaintances I've made over the years, uh, and, and myself included, were very disappointed when you actually care about real education. Right, right. Because it is really a big farce, right. to be honest. And the way it works is it's all about face. Yeah. And, you know, they pass their exams, teach them how to pass the test by parrot learning and stuff and if you try to bring in real western educational skills in fact the more skilled you are if you're actually a qualified teacher from back home right the, the sort of less desirable you are yeah I would you agree. know I the, would agree. the training centers will get tired of you trying to you know do things the right way right right very true <laughs> you know very so true. yes it is very very disappointing from that point of view so hmm. let's go through four countries we'll right. do one each okay, okay. You start with China, the drawbacks and the uh, positives. The drawbacks are you need serious qualifications right. these days to get a teaching job, a legit one. Right. Okay? You need to have a bachelor's degree minimum. You need two years of working experience. You need to be a certain age. Right. You need to have a TEFL. Right. You need to have a criminal background check. You need to have a health check. Right. You're not allowed to have, like, I don't know, AIDS or anything. Yeah. All that kind they of stuff. They actually do test you for that. Yeah, yeah. Sounds weird. <laughs> uh, so, I mean, that's just a little bit of it. 
That being said, if you get a good job, the money is good in China. China has already developed past its developing stage like Vietnam and stuff. And you do have a very uh, established middle class that are willing to pay top dollar for their yeah. children to get a good education, right? So there's a lot of money to be made. If you're teaching at a reputable training center or school, you can start out earning 12,000 RMB. I know people that make 30, mm. but that's like in an international school. Yeah. And that's very hard to get into. Yeah. I'd say the ceiling really is about 16,000 RMB at the moment. Yeah. Unless you're in like the middle of Shanghai or Beijing where yeah. it's expensive. The downside is most people teaching English in China are teaching it illegally yeah. or under the table. Right. A good 80 to 90%. Yeah. Or at least doing side work. Yeah, and doing stuff that they're not supposed to by, by law. And the problem is it's encouraged because of the way China works. You know, all these stupid stringent things getting in place, it chases away the legitimate teachers. Right. So now there are a lot more illegitimate teachers. There. Right. So it can also be very frustrating if you yourself have all of these degrees and everything right. and you work really hard, you get in and then some guy who can't even speak English right. starts working alongside you in your school. Exactly. Earning the same as you. It's kind sure. of frustrating. Uh, absolute drawbacks about the country. Let's move a bit. Um, drawbacks about China. The censorship. Yeah. It's very difficult as a foreigner to accept the fact that... What's going on? Oh. It's an ambulance. Yeah. No, it's very difficult to accept the fact that freedom of speech is not allowed. Yeah. If you speak about anything in your classroom related to politics, yeah. And this has happened to a bunch of many, friends. Many people. Yeah. Speak about anything or allude to anything or, you know, you have a background on a computer that has a Taiwanese flag or something or you mention Tiananmen Square or you just mention anything, you will get fired and very possibly deported. Mm. You are not allowed and cannot access Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, Instagram. Every bloody social media app known to man is blocked. Right. Right. So there's that kind of suppression going on. Right, right. And at the same time, it's very uncertain and the rules for visas and stuff change every year. Right. It's kind of a, it's a very unstable situation. Okay. So those are the drawbacks. Okay. Let's move on to the next one. One tiny little thing I want to throw in. Oh yeah? If you take a public school job in middle school, high school or university, yeah. you'll have one or two students that are hired and actually promoted through the party to sit in your classroom yeah. and report on anything that you do. Uh, I mean, my friend who does uh, work in Shaman yeah. actually has a Communist Party official sitting in his class taking notes. Yeah. Yeah. It's like not even hidden, it's not a student, it's an actual dude in a military uniform sitting there taking notes. Look at Uncle Ho. <laughs> yeah. He's just having a little hug. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, ho, ho, ho. Um, so anyway, mm -hmm. let's move on to Taiwan. Okay. So in Taiwan, I actually, that was my second job, right? Mm. Without getting into too many personal details, when I was in Taiwan, I here. thought that I would make more money than in China. I did, yes. but the situation quickly changed because when I moved to China, it was still quite poor. Right. So all of a sudden, all my friends are moving up in these jobs in China, now making more than I was in Taiwan. Okay. I would say that the benefits of Taiwan, best, most professional teacher training that you will ever have in any of these countries, even compared yeah. to Japan. Right. When I went to, um, Taiwan, I realized that most of the people that have graduated university mm. did so from America. Right. So they already have this kind of Western lens about how education works. Right. So when you go through your teacher training, you actually learn how to teach. Sure. And it probably is in line with what you would normally do. Yeah. Right? Um, Salary is pretty good. Let's say you can make about three thousand dollars a month. Right. Um, not a whole lot more. Okay. Right? Side work is not illegal in Taiwan. Okay, like so you can do China. that. And you, you can, can also actually get like a residence card. And, it, and as soon as you get your job, you get an ARC. Yeah. Free healthcare, you can do anything you want except for vote. That's something that we didn't say about right. China is that you will not be a citizen. Right. Your work visa doesn't give you any kind of special right, right, you know, right. privileges. You don't get health care. Right. You cannot get a driver's license. It's right, incredibly right. hard. Right. I mean, I got one, you got one, but yeah. the amount of hassle. The average person is not yeah. going to go through that. You can't get cheap transportation either. No. There's no, no cheap, you can't go buy a motorbike because no. it's banned in all the cities. Right, right. whereas in Taiwan you can. Yeah, you right. can get a car, it's incredibly expensive and restrictive. Right, right. You know, whereas in Taiwan, for the equivalent of about 100 US dollars, you can buy an old scooter. Right. And you can have your own transport to go That's anywhere what we all want. did, you know. Yeah, yeah. Uh, anyway, so another positive is job security. You have a way to move up within management, if that's mm. your thing, in these centers, right? Sure. That is, 
I think a, a positive for Americans in particular that think of like a low level job, maybe they start as a cashier mm. and they go night manager and shift manager, all that kind sure, of stuff. Sure, you sure. can do that in Taiwan and you sure. can ESL. They actually have foreign managers, unlike in China, they don't have foreign managers. Right, right. They might have a teacher manager, but they'll they have a head the teacher. Whole, they'll be yeah. like a head teacher or something. Yeah. Right. Anyway. Yeah. Um, so that's my thing. Negative, and this is a huge, huge, huge negative, something really, really you got to keep in mind. Right. The hours are insane. So, yeah. On the low end, you'll probably be teaching 30 hours a week. Right, right. But you also need to be in the office writing writing lesson plans and then showing them to people and stuff. Yeah. So I, six days a week, was working nonstop, whereas in China, maybe I was teaching 10 or 15 hours a week. Yeah, yeah, that's it's right. It's much more lax there. Yeah, the, um, the workload is not nearly as high. It's yeah. very, very bad. There's almost no vacations. Right. One day off a week. But you get to... <clears throat> experience all of the lifestyle of a fully developed country there sure absolutely you know that's something that china is still lacks a lot of the things that you'll find in taiwan like uh just food choices right uh hobbies right things to do you know um last positive thing slash negative thing is because the salary is not super high yeah you have to keep in mind that is actually taiwan is a lot cheaper than china in many ways oh it is yeah rent um, for instance but you have to pay for your own flat Right. So it's it's a give and take. It's a give and I, take. I was never in a position where accommodation was provided for me. Sure, in China but most ever. Pe most people are. Yeah, most people do go to like uh, EF or something, right. and that's who we're talking to. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Um, what about Japan? Okay. Now, personally, uh, of course, I haven't worked in Japan, but I do have experience trying to apply for a job. Right. And I have friends, obviously, that moved over. You know, people have seen. I've got my friend Dark and various other people I know over there. Right. It's, uh, again, very strict, the requirements in order to get a job. Right. Right? Let's, uh, let's not die here. Yeah, I'm trying not to die, sorry. Um, okay. <laughs> that's noisy. Um, and that's why my application for a work permit was actually denied when I applied to get a job in Japan. Okay. But that was before I had you know done any extensive studying and I you know I was naive right when I applied for it I was probably about mm, I don't know, 20 or something 1920 somewhere around there and of course you know at that time I dropped out of high school when I was 17 right you know I didn't have a, a massive education I made up for that now I realized that it's important and I actually studied correspondence mm. in order to get my qualifications you know but when I applied I didn't have everything I needed right so they just voided it immediately so they're very strict and very stringent on what you need. Right. It's not like China where you get a lot of people just fresh off the boat, kind of go there on a tourist visa right. and start to work illegally. You cannot do that in Japan. In Japan at all. Right. It's not advisable to try that in any country, but you can absolutely get away with that in countries like uh, Vietnam, right. China, even Taiwan. Right. Um, so yeah, <laughs> that's number one. Number two, the work ethic in Japan is insane. Yeah. All right, it's that's their whole culture. It's the kind of culture that you are not allowed to leave the office until your boss leaves, right? You have to show the utmost respect. You have to dress the part. You have to do a good job. You have to be respectful, and you know you have to check all these boxes off. So if you're not good at dealing with hierarchies and authoritarianism, don't go to Japan. Right. If you're like a happy-go-lucky, you know, yeah, don't don't do it. Very quick downside that all yeah. my friends said. Almost all of my friends that mm -hmm. started in Taiwan, yeah. went to Japan, all came back to Taiwan. Sure. And their number one reason, you can't save money there. Sure. Your salary is almost exactly what a normal Japanese office worker will make. Right. Meaning it's a very expensive country and you're very. not gonna be able, your money's not gonna go anywhere. No, you no. Know? So that's a huge thing. Last one, very quickly, sorry, it's so long. Yeah. Uh, Vietnam. Right, well, Vietnam, a lot of the people that I know who are teaching English in China actually came to Vietnam to teach English instead. And that's because we've just talked about this, but Vietnam is kind of like what China used to be. It's more vibrant, it's more open, there's more opportunity, it's a bit more chaotic and hard and fast with the rules, you know what I mean? So all the people that were hitting uh, visa problems in China right now with all these restrictions, all the people that are getting frustrated with the fact that the internet is constantly being censored more and more and the police are knocking on your doors at night to check your papers and raiding all the, the foreign bars to test for drugs and you know like it's becoming a rather oppressive situation right so all the people that fell afoul of that have ended up in Vietnam because they can live 
the same lifestyle as in China. It's exotic. Yeah. Have a fantastic time. Go out, drink beer all day. You know, chill out, relax. Amazing, cheap food everywhere. Incredibly cheap cost of living. So cheap. Yeah. And they can still do the same kind of you sell walk like a turkey stuff here. Walk like a turkey. Walk like a turkey. Walk like a turkey. Walk like a turkey. Downside very quickly, Vietnam has higher hours than China. Yes. And you'll make much less money. So he said, yeah, it's cool. I, I hate when people say, oh, but the locals make such a low salary. So actually your money goes far. That's great. Sure. It's good if you live here. Yeah. But if you're looking to save money, you're not going to save anything. No. Here. What are you going to send? You make $1,000 a month. Are you going to send home like $300 a month or something? Sure, sure, sure. So the actual ceiling of, uh, you know, smart money savings and stuff is very low here. Yeah. But it's on the up and up. That, that's the thing. In China, I could save about 80% of my salary yeah. every month. You know, you could probably do that here, but it doesn't mean anything. But, but it, do, it does not coincide with that drinking beer, no, partying no, no. lifestyle. No, you're you gonna will be, live cheap. Yeah, you're gonna, yeah. So basically, coming here, there is another thing. There, there's usually a dress code. Yeah. In China, I've I've known university profes professors. You are a professor yeah. too. But you know, university. You wear whatever you want. Yeah, yeah. University professors that come into class with like a, a stained T-shirt, right? Slippers, a hangover, and kind of you know. I didn't do that. No, I know fair, that's that's, I that's know, not, not a you. A lot of my coworkers. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, of course we know those guys. Yeah, yeah. So you have that kind of situation that doesn't fly in Vietnam, no. because in Vietnam it's very tangible. Yeah. Everywhere we've been, people that speak English you can see that they've taken a step up in life. Right. And they're working in some kind of a, a fancy position. Hotel. Even if it's Even if it's just a waiter at, right. a, at a restaurant or something. It's a step above the farmer. The, the farmer who's right. carrying the pork on the back of his bike. Right. You know what I mean? So it's seen as a very professional um, right. sort of a, an industry here. So if you work here in ESL, you're going to be wearing a, a nice shirt and a tie at least. Right, you know right, I mean? right. Makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Anyway. So. Hopefully that was very useful for you guys. Yeah. Uh, let me know what you think. Would you, did you guys ever consider ESL or moving abroad? Leave yeah. that in the comments below. If you liked the video, give us a thumbs up. And also, subscribe if you want to see more. Being an English teacher, is it's not a job that uh, is very highly regarded amongst expats. No. But at the same time, it's not an easy job. If you do it well, it's a very hard job. It's a yeah. very skilled job. Right. You know? Right. And so my hat goes off to the people that actually put the effort in. Right. Yeah. Anyway. Great. Love you guys, and as always, you know the drill. Stay awesome. Yeah, I noticed that you're wearing a clown t-shirt. I am wearing a clown t-shirt. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Okay, now, let's uh, let's just hit the merch. Let's hit the merch. We got, we got a new t-shirt. Why? Why do we have the two of us punching a clown? <laughs> <laughs> this is hard to explain. Yeah, holding a 50 cent. Well, right. we all know about the 50 cent army, sure. right? And basically, Wuma. the Wuma. Uh, so the clown is the 50 center. Mm -hmm. um, but the reason we made this up, it's not just like pulled it out of thin air. <laughs> no. We love reading the, the Chinese forums when they... It's like our favorite yeah, hobby. They discuss us and they have all these stupid um, insults. Right. But they very often use like Chinese idioms well, We usually and understand them. Yeah. Like bottom of the frog, you right. know, bottom, bottom of the well, of the well frog frogs, and, you yeah. know, like all that stuff. White pigs, all that but stuff. But one thing that they used a couple of times, which we couldn't understand, because they, they always call us two cheats, right? Mm. The two cheats uh, making China look bad. But they kept right. saying two cheats hit the clown. And we're like, what the hell is We this? asked everyone. <laughs> we asked Chinese people because, yeah. like, I, I like to think our Chinese is quite good, but we just, it yeah. stumped us. We tried yeah. to translate each character. Yeah. I asked my wife. I asked my friends. Yeah, I asked my wife. No one could understand. They were like, what the hell does that mean? But they kept yeah. saying it. Xiao Chou, what, like, Liang Pian, a Dag Xiao Chou, something yeah. like that. We're like, what the hell does that mean? So we thought, well, you know, we're just going to make a t shirt out. Right. I mean, two cheats at the clown. Yeah, That's so us, dude. We're the two cheats over here. And we're hitting, and we're the, hitting the, the, the 50 cent clown. Right. So if you guys feel the need to. Uh, well, they've been profiting off of us, leaving horrible threats and stuff. We're getting yeah. paid 50 cents per comment. Why can't we recoup just a little bit of that and support yeah. the channel? Join join the, the two cheats hit the clown army. Thank you so much, guys. Don't forget, every single Monday at 1 p.m. EST, you can watch ADV China. You can watch me every single Wednesday at 1 p.m. EST, Lao 86. And right below that, you can watch Serpents a Day just in time for a beer on Friday at 1 p.m. EST.